Tommy, I'm going to say one word, and you tell me what comes to mind. Okay. Defender. Jelly beans. Okay, I wouldn't go on with that, but I can see the resemblance. And today we are talking about Land Rover, Range Rover, and of course the brand new Defender on this third episode of Talking Cars with uh, myself and my son Tommy. So if you guys haven't subscribed yet to this podcast, go to wherever podcasts are sold. Actually, they're free. Uh, iTunes, Spotify, anywhere, and just type in TFL Talking Cars, and you'll get this podcast. So, Tommy, a new Defender. That's right. So the first one, well, that we've had for many, many decades. Yeah. So before we get into kind of what it looks like and you know what it will do and how it fits into the world of the off-road vehicle, let's talk about Land Rover and Range Rover as a company, right? Land Rover and Range Rover started out a little bit after Jeep did. Yeah, and so 1948, they basically copied the Willys Jeep design. Is is the the way that Ooh, the Land Rover fans are not going to be happy with that? Well, they did. I mean, the the um, owner of the Rover Group after World War II had a World War II surplus military jeep, and he used it around his little farm. And he said, "You know what? We should build one of these as well." So all aluminum, because that's what they had at the time, and they they did. So they built the Land Rover uh, Huey 166 was the first one. Do you remember? I remember. And then they I've built got a mug with that on it. Yeah, they built a bunch of series. So they had series one, two, three, and then they had the Defenders. And I think it'd be fair to say that Land Rover slash Range Rover, and they're both basically two companies owned by JLR, mm-hmm. Jaguar, Land Rover, just under a different, um, under the same umbrella. So, you know, Range Rover and Land Rover can be synonymously, I don't know why they separate the names. It's confusing <laughs> to me. But what isn't confusing is that either Range Rover or Land Rover really brought luxury to the off-roading world. Exactly. With yeah. their um, very luxurious and yet very capable off-roaders. Uh, and, you know, I always look at a car company based on what vehicle has the DNA of the brand, right? And if you look at Jeep, it's obviously the... Wrangler. Yeah, of course, right? Um, and with uh, Land Rover, it's always been the Defender. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. And, you know, they only sold the Defender here in the U.S. for a few years in the mid-1990s. And then it, it went away, right? And we didn't see them in the early 2000s. We didn't see them through the 2010s. And finally, for 2020, they decided to bring the new one over. But we should talk about why that's important, because even though Land Rover is a very UK-centric company, the U.S. is a huge market, especially for off-road and SUVs. Yeah, I mean, there's. let's face it, in the U.K., there's not a lot of off-roading, except for, I guess, going, and I, I shouldn't say this, maybe there's tons of it if you guys are in the U.K., but for the most part, America's got a lot more open space where you can go and off-road mm-hmm. versus Europe in general and U.K. specifically. So um, we also have a lot more people, which means we're a lot bigger market here. Right. Um, and, you know, for the longest time, uh, Land Rover was very off-road centric company and then over i'd say probably the last 20 years or so they've gone into what i call urban chic right these are cars now um that are more comfortable in miami beach you know malibu than they are uh, crossing the wilds of namibia now I'm not saying that the cars themselves are engineered that way, but the people who are buying them are certainly using them that way. So I think one of the, the difficulties here is, you know, when you think of comfortable refinement luxury, right, it's it's a, it's a total opposite of what you need for off-road. So when you're looking to design a vehicle to be a luxury-oriented SUV, it, it's got to be soft. It typically has to have independent suspension so it absorbs the bumps well. Uh, unibody to save weight to increase the fuel economy. It needs to be quiet. It needs to be large. And that is not what you need for off-road, right? Off-road, you want um, solid axles. You want a lot of ground clearance, which makes them wallowy on-road. You want big, chunky tires. So basically, the route that Land Rover has gone is let's go more toward the road-going side of the world. But in order to keep that off-road capability, we're going to we're going to have to compromise with software. So, you know, if you look at kind of the, the Land Rover since 2000 and Land Rover since 2005 and Range Rover since the early 2000s, they've been able to compensate for the lack of diff locks and um, solid axles and big tires with terrain response. 
Yeah, and they were really great. They were one of the first companies that did that. Basically, what you do is you take the software that's in the vehicle and you measure wheel speed, and you, in a very simple way, you stop the wheel that's spinning from spinning, so you send power to the one that actually has traction. That's a very simple explanation, but they've they've done it. And initially, they had different terrain modes where you would have like desert or. Um, mud and rocks, mud and rocks, snow, and gravel, grass, yeah. snow. Yeah, and, and then more recently, they've just gone to a completely auto mode where you push a button and it says auto, and then the vehicle figures out whether it's on slippery grass or you know crawling across rocks, and it does the right thing needed to do that. And you know, for the most part, it's been working for them, and especially when you combine that with air suspension, right? So right. you can actually raise the height of the vehicle so that when you need to go rock crawling, you get a little bit more uh, ground clearance, you get a little bit more approach departure angle. That's really the trick, right? Because you just you frankly need ground clearance to go off road. You don't want ground clearance when you go on road necessarily, not a lot of it. So air suspension has been a tactic that they've deployed since, in some cases, in Range Rover the mid '90s, which have allowed them to have a low, comfortable, you know, solid road feeling, and then jack it up to max suspension height when you're off road. And, and we'll talk about some of the pros and cons to that. But that, along with like you mentioned, the different modes have made them pretty good off-road even today. Yeah, we just had actually a uh, Range Rover Sport Hybrid that we took off-road. And if you want to check out that video, we just published it. It's an old versus new. We compared it to our long-term old uh, LR3. By the way, we've owned a bunch of Land Rovers, so we're not new to the Land Rover ownership experience, fortunately and unfortunately. Uh, but, yeah, we, we kind of took it out. And, uh, you know, you mentioned pros and cons. Let's just talk about the pros and cons. There are two huge cons when you're using air suspension, mm-hmm. right? And uh, I'm going to... I'm going to dish a little bit here, right? I was just watching a video of the new Defender uh, that Car Wow did, yeah. right? And Matt Watson took it, what I assume is Land Rover's Proving Ground, mm-hmm. right? Uh, never mentioning the fact that he was on Land Rover's Proving Ground because obviously the biggest problem with that is they're not going to put you in a vehicle and let you go through the Proving Ground and get stuck because that would not make them look good. So if you're on their Proving Ground, it's going to be able to do everything that's there. And if it doesn't, do it, then they won't let you go there, right? Right. And you know, he, he was he was just you know going on and on about how great the approach departure angle is and how wonderful the vehicle does and how much better it is in a Jeep. And I was just I was just sitting there yelling back at the video because a lot of it is just BS, Tommy. And and it is. I'm sorry, it's not right because as much as I appreciate air suspension, two problems with it that are that are critical, and that. If you ever go off-road, on a, seriously, a lot of the automotive journalists are just that, right? They're journalists who review on-road cars and don't go off-road. And the first problem with it is it always fails. It will always fail. Whether it's in a BMW, whether it's in a Mercedes, or whether it's in a Land Rover, given enough time, air suspension fails. So the pumps go out, the seals go out, and if you want to keep a car long-term, you're going to be spending serious amounts of money keeping it working, Right. Yes, that's true. Right? And the second problem, which is a much bigger problem, which nobody seems to talk about, is that, yes, you do get better approach, departure, and breakover angles, but it's like, it's like, you know, it's like running uh, on your tippy toes, right? Right. It, it's not very comfortable because what happens is that when you jack the vehicle up to its highest height, you no longer have any suspension travel, and every little bump along the way you will feel. So think of like a... Uh, on each corner, there's basically an airbag, yeah. right? Let's let's yeah. overly simplify it. Right. Which think of it like a Ziploc bag that you blow up gently, and it's got some pressure, and you can put some pressure on it, and it will absorb, you know, the weight of your hand, for example. But then, if you need more height, you blow up that Ziploc bag more, and it gets bigger. But then, you know, it's not as good as absorbing, you know, the pressure from your hand. And if you blow it up all the way, it's going to be very huge in terms of actual size. But it's going to be a very firm bag, and that's exactly what happens with the um, air suspension, the air springs in any vehicle. The more you inflate them, the higher the ground clearance gets, but the more firm they are, the more unwilling they are to uh, conform to the ground, basically. Yeah, we just uh, had both the Touareg off-road and the Porsche Cayenne, and uh, once again, we hit that same problem. We jacked them up to their highest height, and you're driving along, and it's a backbreaker. You, Yes, you can tackle um, very big obstacles with it, but God help you because there is no room for give in that suspension. But I think you're being a little bit unfair to Matt because I think to his credit, they can be very comfortable. So there's a middle ground, you know, when they're 
somewhat filled up, but also in an off-road setting that's not fully maxed out, you can have a decent amount of suspension travel, and they can be actually very refined. So I think there is a lot of validity in what he's saying. I actually feel like I'm not being harsh enough on Matt, because in part of the video where he goes up this hill, right, he says, this is a vehicle that can do uh, something that many competitors like the Jeep Wrangler can't, right? And he's talking about climbing this hill because he can jack up the suspension and not hitting the bottom. Well, how about the fact that a Jeep Wrangler, and I'm not trying to be a Jeep fanboy, I'm just trying to go right down the middle, right? A Jeep Wrangler will have a front locking diff, which will get you up that hill, whereas a Defender may or may not have it, you know? I mean, we've been off-road so much that there is no substitute, in my mind at least, for the basics, which is being able to lock the vehicle in such a way that all four tires and wheels get traction all the time. And basically, in a Defender, even if you do get that rear locker, you're still going to have three-wheel drive. That's true, but there's pros and cons to both, in my opinion. So, for example, like with the Wrangler, I I completely agree that I think, uh, you know, head-to-head, and we'll have to test this out, I think a Wrangler will go further. Because it does have solid axles, which are just better off-road. And in his video, Matt once again talked about the fact that solid axles are horrible for a ride and that they're not comfortable. Well, he's kind of right. I mean, I, the, the issue with solid axles is you get a lot of this head-bobbing motion. And he also said, Tommy, that you get much more articulation with independent suspension, which is absolutely not that's, true. Yeah, that's that not is true. absolutely, you know, right. horse dewy. I, I agree. Um, but, you know, so the advantage of a solid axle is it's like a teeter-totter. Yes. So when one wheel goes up, it forces the other wheel down, which means that the tires are always in contact with the ground. Yeah. The well, downside well, with, yeah. an indi- with the solid axle is when one wheel hits a bump, the other wheel also is impacted by that bump. So the ride is typically significantly worse off-road. You know, that's why a lot of, um, in some cases, like the Baja trucks have independent suspension. So it's, it's just a matter of are you rock crawling or are you driving long distances off-road? You know what I mean? Yeah, I know what you mean. I guess, you know, it comes down to kind of what, what you are. Are you an automotive journalist or do you work for a company like CarWow? And I'm, I'm, I'm really kind of piling on him, Matt. I like the guy. He's great. But it's not a journalistic review, right? CarWow makes money by selling cars in the U.K. And you don't sell cars by... Uh, you know, talking about the negatives, you, you only highlight the positives. And that, sure. as, as an old school journalist, it really bugs me and it really kind of rubs me the wrong way when people go out there and pretend like, you know, this thing is invincible. It's the best off-roader ever on a course that was set up at Land Rovers, Range Rovers, you know, that it could do it. And then don't talk and then, then pretend like first, like this is a, a, some kind of an independent review when you work for, you know, a company that's basically making money by selling more cars. So let's get back kind of on topic here and talk about the Defender. Yes. And talk about how it's evolved. So the old Defender that you may remember here in the U.S. in the 90s or over in the U.K. in the 70s and 60s and 50s and 40s, right, was an old school Jeep-like architecture. So it had a ladder frame, very squared off vehicle to begin with. It had rigid axles in the front and the back. It had a proper transfer cage with an old school lever. And it was very off-road capable but very unrefined on-road. And that's, that's the case you find with old Jeeps, too. You know, CJs throughout the 70s and 80s, same thing. Great off-road, not good on-road. Uh, and the Land Rover Defender was like that all the way up through 2016 when they finally discontinued it in the U.K. So they stopped production of the old squared-off vehicle in 2016. And it was ancient, right? It wouldn't meet, uh, you know, crash standards or right, fuel right. economy it issues. Cool. It looked cool, yeah, and it was very good off-road. Yeah, we, took a, we did a video where we went up Red Cone. Um, and it was us in the uh, what do we what were, Discovery Two Discovery mm-hmm. Two the Disco Two that we owned, which was actually incredibly off road capable. Yeah, because it was built like a Defender. And yeah, and then very there was similar. on the trail ride, a guy had a Defender, and I was amazed, old Defender of course, right. at how capable it was. It was a mountain goat. Yeah, it absolutely was, and yeah. it was great off road. Very very reliable too yeah. in terms of a longevity in, in you know out on the trail. Plus, they were easily modifiable. So with good old-fashioned coil springs, you could put a bigger spring in, lift it up, bigger tires, right? It, the possibilities were endless, just like a modern-day Wrangler. Yeah. So for 2020, uh, we've, we've got the new Defender. And we should start off by talking about the design because it looks completely different. Do you want to kind of explain that? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, so the design language to me is very indicative of what the company is thinking about where their customers are, right? Uh, and the design language in the entire Range Rover Land Rover uh, um, fleet has gone, to, once again, to what I call urban chic, right? It's very uh, round. It's very um, svelte. It's, in, in a way, it's very sexy, right? It's, it's very urban. Mm-hmm. It's not squared off, you know, square jaw, kind of um, 
rough and tumble. It just looks like it's more at home in downtown London than it does in downtown Moab. Uh, and I think the defender kind of <laughs> cut cut in between that, right? So it's it is a it, there is a strong resemblance to the old defender. You know, you still have round lights that are kind of now frowny. It looks a little bit like one of those frowny Jeeps you see, right, where they <laughs> yeah. cut off the top of the, right. the headlights. Um, it's still kind of boxy, but in a much more rounded off sort of way. Uh, and, and they're cues to the old one, especially like in the rear when you look at the taillights and the way they resemble the old ones. Uh, I actually like the design. I think it's a very uh, uh, sexy looking um, off-roader. And uh, I think they did a good job. The front's a little bit nondescript, uh, but the rest of it is is good, especially compared to uh, you know some of the other ones that Land Rover Range Rover has recently come up with. I like the rear how it just ends. Yeah, you know, kind of like the old boxy ones where it just stops. The front, and here's one of the pickles you know that modern manufacturers face now. That's not a cool word I use, pickle. But <laughs> the fact of the matter is. You know, there's a lot of crash safety requirements that go into designing new vehicles, sure. like pedestrian safety, sure. right? Tall hood. So having a 90-degree angle right at the nose is not great for fuel economy, and it certainly isn't great for that pedestrian uh, that, God forbid, you, you might hit, right? Right. So they have to keep that in mind. However, it is a little bit more round than I would have liked. So the new Wrangler, right, the JL, it also has to conform to modern safety standards. But it, it's a little bit more squared off, a little bit more square jawed. Uh, you know, this Defender, my issue with it, especially from the front, is if you got rid of the word Defender on the front, it could be That's a discovery. It's, it's, a little, it's, yeah. a little, it's a little beige. Where, like, the Wrangler was always going to be it's, a Jeep. It's funny because a lot of this has to do with, you know, where you're sitting. It's your perspective. If you're in the U.K. and you look at – and I, I keep – Picking on the Wrangler, but it could be a G wagon that still has three lockable differentials. Mm-hmm. But it depends on where you're sitting. If you're in the UK and you're looking at a Jeep, you think to yourself, and I'm talking about a Wrangler here. It's very unrefined. It's very unsafe. It barely gets crash test right. right. It's very brick like, um, and they don't understand over there that it's basically the Harley Davidson of vehicles. You can customize it all you want, and people aren't buying it because they want a comfortable vehicle that's going to take them to work uh, on the autobahn. Right? They're buying it because they, they want a lifestyle vehicle that they. They can slap huge wheels and tires on and jack up and make it their own. Uh, and, and it's the same way we're looking at the Defender, right? We're looking at it as being maybe a little too urban, yet, you know, we want something that we can do what we can do with the Jeep, right, which is jack it up, which is hard to do with air suspension uh, and improve yeah, it ourselves, right? That's right. I mean, the, the modification potential, especially in the suspension department, is, is seriously limited with air suspension and independent suspension. But the good news is you, uh, Land Rover has thought of that, and you can modify – it to your own personal taste yeah, with we, a lot of different cool options, right? There's a snorkel, there's a winch, there's a bull bar, uh, there's a ladder. There's just a lot of cool stuff you can slap on it, making it more overlandy and less off-roady. Does that make sense? So in terms of other design elements, yeah. there are some carryovers from the old Defender, like the Alpine windows, yeah. which are these roof-mounted windows in the rear corners. Great. Really cool. The spare tire is still slung out the rear. Yeah. you got the rear swing gate. And you got the diamond plate, which is now plastic. Yeah, yeah they, had, they put fake diamond plating on the hood. Yeah. And let's talk about a little bit about what you're talking about, right? So these are the accessory packs. And you actually purchase them when you spec out your vehicle. Now, to begin with, there's two variations of Defender. There's the 90, which is a short wheelbase, really three-door. And then there's the 110, which is the long wheelbase, five-door. So you have to decide, do you want the short or the long one? And then you've got a couple other options like engines. We can talk about that as well. And then you get to accessory packs. And these are basically uh, pre-assembled packages that Land Rover has put together that will allow you to kit out your Defender to what you're going to use it for. So, for example, there is an urban pack, which is the most reoriented. So it gives you like a, a special tire carrier and a front undershield, which is more visual, uh, and a bright scuff plate. Then there's a country pack. And as we go up the packs, it gets more and more off-roady. So it goes urban, country, adventure, and eventually you get to explore pack. And this is a really cool one. So the explorer pack gives you flare wheeled arches. It gives you a factory roof rack. Uh, it gives you the storage box on the rear side, a ladder like you talked about, and then the raised air intake, um, as well as um, uh, wheel arch protection, spare tire cover, and then some hood decals as well. So that is an expensive pack. It's $4,800, but that's the one you're going to want if you plan on taking your Defender out into the wilderness. 
Yeah, yeah, and I love the way that they're selling that. I think there's a really uh, smart marketing plan to be able to, you know, kind of make the Defender your own. Uh, and I think that's really clever and um, really cool. Now, in terms of pricing, right, they start at, what, about 55 ish and then they get very expensive very well, quickly. Well, in the U.S., Land yeah. Rover will tell you they start at 49900 You'll never find that one, of you, course. No. Gee whiz, yeah. you're not going to find that one. Yeah. That's for the 110. Yeah. In fact, I want to – let me double-check this. But I'm pretty sure that the two-door, the, the shorty one, is more expensive. Isn't that funny? So on the Wrangler, the, the smaller one, of course, is cheaper. But, yeah, I'm right, actually. So the, the Defender 90, the short one, starts at 65100 whereas the long wheelbase starts at fifty. So yeah. fifteen grand more for the smaller truck. And, and – um I think, like the Corvette and like other vehicles that there has been a lot of excitement and demand over, uh, they're doing a special launch edition, which yeah. is going to be a little bit more expensive and a little bit more kitted out than the rest of the lineup. It's called the first edition, yeah. so that one actually starts at sixty-eight grand. Yeah. So you've jumped up eighteen grand. There's also an X, which is going to be the more fully loaded one. That one starts at eighty thousand dollars. Yeah. So, you know, Wranglers are expensive. Uh, but they probably ended about 60. This probably starts where a Wrangler ends. That's right. That's exactly right. And engine-wise, two different options. So there's the P300, mm-hmm. which For, has... In the U.S. In the U.S., yes, yeah. Yeah, we don't get right. the diesels. There's diesels yeah, abroad. Right, right. But in the U.S., there's a P300, which is a Ingenium, yeah. two-liter uh, twin-turbocharged, actually. Which we just had in that Range Rover hybrid. Yeah, gas engine. Yeah. 296 horsepower, a 0-60 to 60 in 7.7, 7, according to Land Rover. This is the 110. Uh, and then there's also a P400, which is a, a mild hybrid, that is a Ingenium 3-liter six 6-cylinder, 395 horsepower, 0 to 60 in 5.8. So depending on how much you want to spend, keep in mind that it gets a lot more pricey if you get the big engine. It's something like $12,000 more expensive. Ooh. So you've got a couple different options and then only one transmission. That's another thing that some of the old school guys complained about. No more manual trans, only an automatic. Now, uh, Land Rover uh, did have a drive for a journalist uh, scheduled, and that was, of course, called off because, well, you know, what happened there. Uh, and they did do an earlier one where they took a bunch of journalists to Namibia, and those reviews are out, and I've been reading them. Uh, some of our friends went on that one. i gotta be tell- I got to tell you, I'm a little jealous, you know. <laughs> to be able to go drive a, a Land Rover in Namibia would have been a bucket list item. Uh, and uh, we've been reading those. Um, so, so, so the reviews are out there right now, and, and most of them are very positive, Tommy. Yeah, absolutely. And, of course, I mean, it would be hard not to be positive with an all-expense trip paid to Namibia. Namibia, that might be. <laughs> that, that might be a, somewhat of a, of a factor. But a um, couple other things you need to know about the Defender. It's actually a number of seating options ranging from five to seven-seater configurations. And it appears to be a little bit more upmarket than the Wrangler. So, you know, you can get a Wrangler without... Uh, power windows, right? Yeah. You're not going to find that on the Defender. You know, we keep comparing it to a Wrangler. I think maybe a, a more fitting price category would be Land Cruiser, right? Because then you're in that same kind of land. Yeah, but it's so much smaller than a Land Cruiser. Yeah, Land Cruiser is a three-row here in America. In Europe, they have the Prada, right? Which Prado, is, yeah. Yeah, which is probably the more direct competitor to it. Uh, certainly, a G-Wagon would be much more expensive. Uh, Foreigner would be a lot cheaper. Um, so it kind of lives in this own unique space, right? Yeah, I feel like it's too expensive, you do? Yeah, I do. Um, I think if they're going over, uh, you know, eighty eighty thousand dollars, right? It's a it's a big ask because eighty thousand dollars, you're well into Land Rover Discovery territory, which is going to be bigger and more refined. And speaking of the Land Rover Discovery, uh, early reports suggest that a lot of the uh, parts off of Discovery are also in the Defender, which makes sense, right? I mean. If I were Land Rover, Range Rover, I'd do the same thing. I would, I would, I would try to utilize common parts for savings. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. And the new Defender now is actually unibody. Yeah. Right. So the old one was ladder chassis. This one's unibody. And Land Rover says it's stiffer than any Land Rover they've ever ever made. But it's still a yeah, unibody. Yeah, hey, I, I have a question about that. Every time a car manufacturer, uh, uh, we've been doing this for ten years now, right? Mm-hmm. Rolls out a new car, they always say this car is as stiff as we can ever make it, right? Or this is the stiffest car in the history of whatever. Pick the vehicle, right? <laughs> right. And yet they do that every time. So I, I'm wondering how, how much stiffer can the cars get if every generation becomes the stiffest ever? It's really a number that I'm starting to kind of have doubts about, right? Because we've heard that so many times over and over. And and, and yet sometimes I'm not sure stiffer is better. You know, we have that LR3, which I suspect isn't as stiff <laughs> as the new Defender. Uh, and um, it's a truck. It's not, you know, 
like Grand Cherokee is also unibody. It's always been unibody. Mm-hmm. But the Defender is a truck. It's body on frame. The LR3. The LR3 yeah. is, a, is a body on frame. It's both. It's, it's, kind, kind, of yeah, both. it's kind, yeah. kind of this weird kind of like right, like, right. like just like our um, – our, our old Jeep truck, right? That's also half and half. Yeah, exactly, the Comanche. Comanche. Anyway, um, off-road, it's one of the most comfortable vehicles I've ever been in. I love, I actually love ladder frame trucks off-road just because uh, maybe they're not as stiff, but they seem to do a much better job in absorbing the, the kind of the terrain. Well, and, you know, if you recall, the old Unimogs were actually designed to bend in the middle yeah. because they wanted it to conform better to the environment it was driving over. So that was not stiff at all, and that was probably, if not the best off-roader ever made. So I, I got to admit to you, is, you know, when I was younger, I, I cared about, like, tackling the hardest obstacle. So to me, the the, the way you proved credibility in the off-road world was to be able to uh, go up – all the obstacles in Hell's Revenge, right? Yep. Up the escalator, doing the hot tubs. And to me now, that, that is meaningless because you can design a vehicle to do that pretty easily. To me, the ideal off-roader, and this is why I love side-by-sides, and actually the Raptor as, as well, is the softer the ride, the better the off-roader because I just no longer really enjoy being in a vehicle where you're like <laughs> okay, for so- hours on end. It just gets really old, and I've done it so much, I'm just not – thrilled to, to be on that you know ride anymore so going back to the argument though you might prefer a defender over a wrangler yeah right? i agree because uh, yeah, the defender is probably going to be softer Yeah, because with, with those solid axles you get that kind of lateral side to side movement right yeah and it gets really old but that's why i think things like the new raptor and the side by sides that actually have active suspension right where the suspension adapts to the kind of terrain and actually changes how stiff it is and how soft it is based on, you know, right. electronic inputs uh, is probably the best solution. Yeah. I mean, I think it takes more than just... I guess I like live. desert running more than rock crawling. Right. Well, I think you're more of an overlander kind of guy. Yeah, maybe I'm getting old. Because I don't think we, we don't really do any desert running here in Colorado. Yeah, there's not a lot of desert. But traveling distance on, you know, kind of rough, rougher terrain, but not, you know, having to crawl over everything. That's kind of what we do a lot of. And certainly a comfortable ride is, is definitely helpful there. So if you're thinking that Landover, though, has completely abandoned the off-roaders, there's actually a couple of things on the new Defender that speak otherwise. So there's an off-road pack. It's about $1,400. That gives you a proper um, electronic locking differential uh, with torque vectoring. Rear diff. Yeah, rear diff. Because it has a center diff. Yeah, and, and a center diff lock, right. too, yeah. Exactly. And then off-road tires. So that's a great thing. You can also what get What are the it. tires? I don't know what the tires are. I think we looked at them. I think they're Scorpions. Hmm. I think they're scorpions. I think they're more aggressive than that. I don't think so. I saw it in LA. They were scorpions. I don't. Did that one have the off-road package? Hmm. I think so. Yeah. So, so Europe. This is the other thing that's very different between Europe and the UK and America, right? In America, off-road tires are um, big old Ko twos, or you know, pick your off-road tire that you like. Falcons, Coopers. I'm not. I'm not trying to play favorites. Toyos, but they've got big lugs and big side protection, right? Because these tires can and are used. In places where, you know, there's a lot of rocks and sharp, pointy things that will puncture a tire. Whereas in Europe, when they talk about off-road tires, it's usually like Verde Scorpions, which are Pirellis, right? And these are just much more um, aggressive all seasons. But they're not big lugs. They don't have side protection, and they're not crazy um, off-roady. That's true, but in Namibia, they were running dirt tracks. Okay, well, there you go. So they could be a proper tire. Yeah, but those dirt tracks may have been put on. Yeah, I agree. For, for Namibia and not, you know, not, not off, the, off the truck when it comes from the UK. Okay, so there's also an off-road package, in, yeah. depending on the trim. Um, sorry, advanced off-road capability package, which will give you a different terrain response system called yeah. Terrain Response 2, as well as all-terrain progress control, basically off-road cruise control. And then a couple other fun things. You can get it with rubber floors. And you can even get it with the bench seats in the front. Well, yeah, which is way cool. Yeah, that would come with the center one, like a pickup truck, right? Yeah, Very similar. exactly. So you've got a, a, a um, an open center area for feet. So you know, it's easy to say that Land Rover has completely abandoned their off road route to the Defender. I, I never, but I don't think they. I have. never said that. I said they went urban chic. So hey, guys, in the comments below, let us know what your favorite kind of suspension is, because there's really three kinds, right? There's like the Wrangler, which is uh, basically. Um, Full solid axles. Full solid axles, right? Springs, yeah. And now there's a Defender, which is fully independent front and rear. Yep, and then there's like what we think the new Bronco is going to be, or the Forerunner, right? Which is solid rear axle, independent front suspension, or or, or the new um, G Wagon. That's that way too. Yeah. So yeah. is that is that the kind of the best mix of? 
you know, hardcore off road to, to on road usability. Um, I don't know, but there's, you know, that, that independent versus solid axle debate has been going on forever. So another thing that people are going to be happy about is the towing capability, yep. which is huge. Wrangler can only tow up to 3,500. Yes. Defender is supposed to tow up to 7,700, which is a, a huge number. Yeah, that four-cylinder is not going to be happy towing. Well, I'm thinking you have to get the six for that. <laughs> yeah, I don't think it's going to be towing 7,700. But that's a lot, right? That's uh, uh, more than like a forerunner. Yeah. That's um, it's getting up there to that's like, like G-Wagon territory. Yeah, you're getting in there to like big American truck, yes. Tahoe. Yeah, <laughs> A huge number. Yeah. 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 And speaking of which, I don't think a Tahoe would actually compete, but you're also in the price range of a Tahoe or a Suburban or right. an Escalade. But those are more family haulers, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they've also gone to independent. Uh, they have. Yeah. Yep, fully yeah. independent. Yeah, and there's a lot of advantages to that. Like we said, it makes it a lot better on road. But uh, it gets hard off road. The other thing um, that air suspensions, when you jack them up, have an issue with is articulating, right? Right. Because they're so firm, they don't want to. Um, really conform to the the environment they're in. So one way Land Rover's gotten around that is by actually cross-linking the air suspension. And then for a long time. Yeah, which is like yeah. a rubber tube that actually extends from corner to corner. And then when one wheel's forced up, the other wheel's forced down. So basically it can mimic a solid axle. It just isn't a solid axle. Yeah, and I got to say, say, I love the design of the interior. I oh, like, it's really cool. Yeah, I like the way yeah. they kind of made it. I'm a little worried about the infotainment system, the one that we just had, which is basically the same one, I suspect, in the Range Rover um, hybrid, uh, was a little laggy and a little finicky. Well, let's just say it, it was really hard to use. Yeah, it was really hard to use. And it looks like it'll be a pretty similar system in the... In the Defender. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Car companies tend to be really bad at, at doing uh, software, and I think none is more challenged than uh, Land Rover JLR. They have that cool center bar that runs the whole length of the dash. Yeah. That's very old school, like the old um, series Land Rovers. So I think the interior is a win. I like their cloth seat materials, too. It's almost like a canvas, which is cool, depending on which, which seat you get. And the best part of the exterior design, which we forgot to talk about, are the wheels. So you can get all the way from 18s to, I want to say, 22s. Yeah. But the base wheel is actually a, a gloss white steel wheel. And it looks so cool. Yeah. And, you know, I was talking to a local dealer, and they said they should be getting their first shipment in end of March, which is right about now, right? I, don't, I haven't checked back whether they have. And, of course, with the world being turned on its head, that may all change. Uh, I kind of feel like uh, we're... Um, we're at the dawn of a new off-road age with all these cool off-roaders coming and then everything went topsy-turvy all of a sudden because I was super, you know, this was going to be the year of the new off-roader. Like the Bronco. Yeah, the Bronco, the baby Bronco, the uh, Defender, um, you know, the, the Gladiator. Um, there's just a bunch of really cool off-roaders coming and uh, right now, you know, we don't know if they're actually coming and when they're coming because i know i'm sure they've suspended production in the uk because everybody suspended production so we'll just have to batten down the hatches and hopefully by the summertime we can actually get our hands on one yeah i mean it's a shame we weren't invited to namibia and it's a shame we couldn't go to the the british launch yeah. and um, because we would have loved to got that content out to you guys but you know what are you going to do what are you going to do it's just it is what it is i mean we're um at least here talking about it um so tommy we've had the lr2 I'm sorry, we've had the Disco 2. Mm -hmm. Now we have a Disco 3. Mm -hmm. uh, the one vehicle that is actually coming up in popularity is the Disco 1. I would say, to, in my mind, that's kind of the last Land Rover that was really off-road worthy that we could buy here in America. Yeah, so the Disco 2 is pretty similar to the ones, yeah. but the, the ones are a little bit more robust. And they're a little shorter, a little bit, you know. Yeah, they actually share a lot underneath with, well, they're based on the Range Rover, the yeah. old, old Range Rover from 1970, right? Right. But they, they've got a lot of the same philosophy as the old Defender, too. And they all had the center diff locks, just a really and short... And some had locking rear diffs. Short wheelbase, yeah. but very capable off-road and actually very robust off-road. Uh, the, they all used here in the USA um, a 3.9 or a 4 a liter. Which wasn't green. V8. Yeah, which eventually blew its head gasket. Yeah, yeah. inevitably. Exactly. And let's talk about the big gorilla in the room, and that is, of course, uh, Land Rover, Range Rover reliability, right? Um, I think a good marker of that is resale values. Uh, and, you know, just looking around Craigslist, you can buy a 10 year old Range Rover, which probably costs 90 100k when it was new yeah for under 10k now oh i know you yep. know uh, yeah, i yeah. mean they, they do depreciate a lot and that is because the reliability um hasn't 
for many people been there. Now, having said that, the two that we've had, we've had very little problems with. Pretty much perfect. Pretty much perfect. But for the most part, um, reliability has been a sore point and kind of the Achilles heel of the brand. Yeah. I mean, I think there's no arguing that. And it's kept a lot of people in Lexuses. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that may have made may, or, or Toyotas. Toyotas. Yeah, or, like the Land Cruiser. Or, or, or G-Wagons. And like I said, you know, anytime you have air suspension, it's just going to fail. It, right. And when it fails, it's not like, hey, I got to go take it in. It's like it squats down. It's like a, you know, like a, like a, um, Stubborn dog, right? Yeah. <laughs> it sits down and you got to drag it by the collar and it's not going to get up. Yeah. No, I, I think you're right. But, you know, I think speaking of discovery, and I, a lot of people have been saying this online too. This is not my original thought. Right. But the new Defender should have been what the Discovery 5 is in a lot of ways. So the old school guys are thinking that they should have, you know, built this as the Discovery 5 and then come out with an even harder core Defender. Because, in my opinion, the Discovery 5 is not at all what the Discovery used to be, right? It used to be very squared off, yeah, kind of adventure And the new know, Discovery is not that you, at all. You know, I am completely and utterly baffled by that, right? And here's what I'm baffled about. So, one of the things that made a Land Rover, a Land Rover or a Range Rover was that command driving position, right? Basically, you're sitting, like, on top of the vehicle with the steering wheel, kind of like a bus in front of you. Yeah. And you feel like you're looking down upon the world. <laughs> and with the new Disco 5... They completely went to a regular SUV crossover, right? So you're sitting in the thing, not on top of it. You don't have that command driving position. And they went away from my favorite feature, which is the stadium seating. Sure. Or if they did, they, they made it so minimal Slight. that you yeah. can't tell, right? And what I mean by the stadium seating is if you look at, like, this one that we have pictured right here, right? You can see that um, kind of upkick in the roof where the second row is. So the people in the second row feel like they're sitting on top of the vehicle above the first row so you can see over and feel like you're once again, you know, on top of the world and the world is kind of happening below you. It's really cool. And they went away from both of those things in, in, in many ways. I don't know why. I'm baffled. I'm absolutely baffled by that. And they started this in the Discovery 4 as well in some of the later ones. But one of the cool things about the LR3s and the Discovery 3s and then the 2s and the 1s as well is they all had a lot, regardless if you got a base model SD or SE or the fully loaded HSE, right? They all had a fairly similar amount of off-road capability. What I mean is they all had air suspension, yep. and they all had, Train here in the response. U.S., this is important, yeah, and they all had air suspension, and they all had low-range transfer cases, which is what you really need in those vehicles to make them good. Right. But then starting on the Discovery 4, the late ones, they made the <laughs> the low-range an option, right? And then discovering starting on Discovery 5... Now you have to buy an expensive one if you want a low range and if you want the air suspension. Because the vast majority of new discoveries you'll see will have steel springs, no low range. Which really doesn't make them any different than like a Tahoe. Right? If you don't have that, that technology in there, you know, the new Discovery 5 without that is, is not going to be that, that impressive off-road. Which is always what made Land Rover cool is that they were classy and refined and then you could go. Maybe the reason for that is they've uh, looked at who is buying them and... Let's face it, you know, when you buy a $90,000 vehicle, chances are you're not going to take it off-road. So why provide all that off-road crud or cred? Yeah, but, but uh, uh, crud, yeah. But Mercedes still does it with the Gs. Yeah, Mercedes, right? yeah. I'm sure it's like 0.00001% of the G-Wagon buyers take their new Mercedes off-road. But they include it in there because it's aspirational, right? People think they're going to be out going camping with their G-Wagons. Not that anyone actually does, but they, they like having all that capability at the push of a button, even if it'll never be pushed. Yeah, I know. I mean, when I was growing up, I used to watch Mutual of Omaha, right? And they would be in Africa, and every time they were in Africa, they'd be in a Land Rover um, series, whatever, right. right? And it was really quirky and really iconic, you know, like you had the spare tire on the front. Yeah, on the hood. On the hood, and then you had those two round lights. And there's there's something that, that uh, oh God, I, I don't want to just be uh, whining all the time, but to me, the classic off-roader is always two round lights and some kind of a grill in between, right? Okay. And when Jeep went to square lights, people hated it. Yeah. I'm talking about the YJ, right? Right, right. Uh, and I'm not sure that Land Rover should have gone to that kind of frowny headlight thing, right, where they covered up the round lights. Because those, those round headlights give any vehicle kind of a much more friendly, kind of like a lost puppy dog. I'm ready to go, I'm ready to go, I'm ready to go, right? And the second you cover them up, it gives it a more purposeful look, but it's no longer that kind of, I want to go, I want to go and play, right, from a design point of view. Yeah, I, I think you're spot on. Yeah. Um, so... 
Yeah, we'll, we'll see. Now, does that mean uh, I don't want one? Hell yeah, I'd love one. I can't wait to actually get behind the wheel and, and try it out. I mean, you know, the, the thing I'm probably most excited about this year is actually taking a Defender to Moab and comparing it to a Wrangler, maybe even a G-Wagon. I, I think that would be a hell of a comparison. Um, and when all this blows over, you know, we got to go do that. Yeah, I think that's that's a great idea. And actually, you know, you know, not it's going to be hard to get all three of them at the same time. It is going to be all very. By hard. the way, guys, you know, we we really work hard on matching or mashing cars up, getting vehicles that compete. But we can't just snap our fingers uh, and get the vehicles that we want, especially not vehicles that are kind of low production like the G wagon. Yeah, it's it's it becomes a real real challenge. But I, yeah. I, you know, but. That's the video that, that I want to make, and that's the video that I want to see, and that's a test that we should be doing, not, you know, taking a vehicle through their course and then, you know, wow, this thing's great, but actually comparing it to the competing vehicles and seeing how it actually does in places like Fins and Things or Hell's Revenge where it's actual um, real-world testing versus kind of, you know, development. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, and hopefully if things – Turn out in our favor. Uh, certainly the the G wag or uh, certainly the Wrangler and the Defender we can probably get at the same time. I think that's pretty doable. So guys, let us know you know in the comments below. I'm really curious if like if you're a Jeep guy or gal, and if you're a Land Rover guy or gal, do you ever cross shop the two? Would you be out there actually like, hey, I'm thinking about getting a Wrangler, but you know what? Now that the new Defenders out there, I may go look at a Defender. Or even a G wagon is that? Are these are these three different buyers? Are these three different worlds? Or do these worlds at some point connect? I think the G wagon buyer because it starts at one hundred and twenty five grand. Exactly right. But a used G wagon, yeah, potentially. Uh, but uh, once again, though, someone buying your typical your typical Wrangler buyer won't know that a G wagon is yeah. offer capable. I think that there's more overlap than we think. Yeah. Because so many of the Wranglers now, the Rubicons, which they sell a lot of Rubicons every year, are the fully loaded models. Right. You know, touching sixty grand. Yeah. And I don't think it's that far fetched to think that someone buying a sixty grand Wrangler may actually go out and consider buying a sixty five thousand dollar Defender. Right? That's that's not that you know, when you're when you're at those prices, uh, the price sensitivity isn't quite as great as when you're at like fifteen or twenty thousand dollars. So there might be some overlap there. Of course, if you're looking at buying like a used Wrangler, you're going to be waiting a while so these defenders hit the used market. But for the the person that wants all the bells and whistles on their Jeep, the Defender may be right in their price bracket. How about a Land Cruiser? Would you think people cross shop it with a Land Cruiser? No, people who buy Land Cruisers only want Land Cruisers I think and right. they won't yeah. consider anything else. <laughs> and no one else would ever buy a Land Cruiser but those people. And there's a new one of those coming too. And there's only like, uh, what, uh, 3,000 Land Cruisers about that are three to 5,000 yeah. that are sold each year. I love Land Cruisers, but no one's like, I was going to buy a Range Rover. But look at this Toyota. I mean, <laughs> you know, people who buy Land Cruisers know exactly what they're about and they would never buy anything else. So I don't think there's going to be a lot of cross shopping there. Like, like if you're buying a Range Rover or a Disco, right? So I'm just guessing at this. So let me know in the comments if I'm wrong. But if you're buying a Disco, you're probably looking at a, a, a luxurious, um, somewhat prestigious uh, family hauler. Well, I think someone buying right? a Discovery would be looking at buying an X5 or a GLE or a GLS. Yeah. And if you're buying a Range Rover, Sport, or even a full-on Range Rover, right? You're probably looking at... Um, I think there's some status there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Status, right? It's about, hey, uh, I want to let the world know that I'm successful, and so I've got this very luxurious uh, British vehicle that has this pedigree. It's like, a, it's like a Tesla Model X. Right. Yeah. Right. And if you're buying a, a, a G-Wagon, you're like, all those guys and gals that can't afford this... <laughs> Have right. to go for Range Rovers, but we're going to go for the, you know, for for the G wagon. Yeah. Um, but where does the Defender fit into that world? You know, because the people who buy Wranglers, they buy them because I think they want to customize them and they want to make them their own. You know, there's certainly a large percentage that will never take them off road, but there's a much bigger percentage that want it because it's a lifestyle thing and they want to say, hey, I'm healthy, I'm fit, I'm off roady, I'm outdoorsy. Uh, but where does the Defender fit into this? I, I, I'm curious about, like, who is going to be buying the Defender? Is it going to be those people? Is I, it going to be the people who want a more off-road-worthy family truckster? Is it going to be the people who want to show off their wealth? What's the, what's the buying? I think there's certainly going to be 
the Land Rover people that buy it. Yeah. It's a very kind of a small community. Yeah. But there's going to be, you know, a few, I'm going to guess 100 people. The British Atlantic Here community. in the U.S., yeah, exactly. That had the Discovery 5 and the 4 and the 3 and the old Defender. And they've got Discovery 1 as well. And they're going to be like, okay, I'm going to get the new Defender. And then I think the next people that are going to buy it are the people you're talking about, right, who want to show people they live an active lifestyle. But rather than being 30, right, they're going to be 50 or 60. You know, it's going to take a more mature audience to buy uh, that Defender. Not only because they're more more mature. I I didn't say ancient. I said more (laughs) mature. Um, And I think that that certainly is going to be part of it is is someone that has the money to buy a Defender but also wants to show that they're they're outdoorsy. But but the problem you run into immediately, right, is – well, we, we won't go into that story. One day we will about what happened when we went and saved somebody in a Range Rover and then how, how that bit us in the butt. <laughs> yeah. right? Uh, right. The problem you run immediately when you take a $60,000 vehicle or $70,000 vehicle off the lot, you do not want to put that in harm's way. Right? Well, Two words, trail damage. That's the problem. It, no matter how capable it is, it would be very painful for even somebody like me who spends a lot of time off-roading to take that vehicle and – put it in harm's way, which you will do. There's, once you go off-road, you're going to pinstripe it. You're going to you know, tear the bottom out of it. You're going to you know, crush wings, as you Brits like to say, fenders, as we like to say, right? That's out of the question. I mean, you know, we, and we've talked to Landover before. They said it takes seven years or 100,000 miles before any of their vehicles ever see dirt. And I think it's going to be the same thing with the But defender. Jeeps don't, right? Jeeps you don't feel that bad about because they got these, like, they're, they're really easily replaceable yes, parts that get, could... Let's not get skewed. Like, we're driving press Jeeps, right? right. If you went out and spent $62,000 on a brand new we, shiny... We did, we did on, a, on a Gladiator. We put it in harm's way yesterday. Yeah, I agree. But we're a little weird. If you're the <laughs> average person that spent sixty three grand on a shiny new Wrangler diesel, yeah, yeah. right... I would. I don't think that person's going to take it off road. I mean, someone ten years from now who's buying a twenty thousand dollar TJ, right? They're for sure going to take it off road. But brand new, I don't think. And we actually asked uh, Johnson's Auto Plaza about this. Yeah. Do you remember what yeah. the largest Jeep dealer in the state yeah. and well. and the uh, managing uh, uh, sales manager yeah. came out and said, "Look, when the when the new Wrangler came out, people would walk in and they say, I want a fully loaded Rubicon, and I want it right now.'" And and he'd be like, well, you know, you need the diff locks and the swayboard disconnect. And then that per- that purchaser would say, I don't know what any of that is. I just want the fully loaded Rubicon, and I want it right now. And I think there's going to be a percentage of those people. Yeah. What you're saying is they wanted that Rubicon sticker. Yeah. Right? That, mm-hmm. th- on the hood. That's and what there's going to be people that want that Defender sticker on the hood. Or on the front. Or on the, yeah. <laughs> on the exactly. nose. Well, guys, there you have it. You've... Uh, Spent another hour with myself and my son, Tommy, talking off-roaders, talking Land Rovers. Uh, Thank you for taking the time. And uh, if uh, you're watching this on YouTube and you want to listen to it, hopefully at home now that you're probably at home, or if you're actually managing to drive somewhere in the car, listen to it as a podcast wherever great podcasts are not sold but given away for free. (laughs) All right, guys. We'll see you guys next time right here at the Fastlane Car. Thanks for watching. Ciao.